<laughs> well, my name is Pastor Chris Johnson. Actually, it's not Pastor Chris Johnson. I, I, my name is Chris Johnson, but it's got a pastor on it, you know, to begin with. But anyway, uh, and I was with the Calvary Chapel in Banning for, I don't know how many years, and uh, at least 16. The reason why I say 16 is because I read a book by Chuck Smith who said that it took 16 years for him to see any growth. And, I, and that was when I was 10 years in the ministry not seeing a lot of growth. And I thought, oh no, another six years. You know that it was 16 years before I started seeing growth. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, I, then we wound up building in Beaumont, um, there in uh, 2005, actually he moved a tent on 2010, and then a building. But uh, and now I'm re I'm retired uh, for eight years, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Anybody retired in here? You don't want to admit it. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about then? It's like, uh, golly, I, I had all these dreams about what it meant to retire. to get to this, that, and everything else, and then you do this, that, and everything else, and you go, now what? But to me, it's ministry, and what a blessing uh, it is. And we can always minister no matter how old we are. Amen? Amen. So, uh, but... Uh, also, a little background, I'm also an adoptive parent. My wife and I couldn't have kids, so uh, we went to Peru in 1991 and wound up adopting a child, two months old, in Peru. And that's a whole other story. It took two months to do, and the Shining Path were very active. In other words, they're a terrorist group. And we, <laughs> the third day, uh, we were shaken with a bomb that took about three, three blocks away. It was a car bomb. It shook the whole place. And, uh, and then, you know, we'd hear machine gun fire behind us and hear a boom in the distance and the power would go off because they blew up a, um, a, a cell tower, or not a cell tower, we didn't have cells, in it, but uh, power. And so it was a really interesting time and so we brought our daughter back, and we were so glad <laughs> that we were able to do that. Um, and so uh, she's 32 now. And, but there are so many things that are similar but different, too, to being a, a parent of, of uh, adopted, uh, you know, adopting children. Uh, are, are any parents in here who have adopted kids? God bless you. Okay, what else back there? And anyone else over here? Back there, thank you. Amen. Well, that, there we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, it, it's different, isn't it? It's um, you're, you're a parent, but then you're not in some sense. And especially you start, they, they start getting older. It's, they're curious. And, and my daughter, I'm very white, you know, and my wife is very, well, she's Norwegian. I don't, you know, she's kind of very white as well. And so uh, my daughter wasn't. <laughs> she's Peruvian. And so she would get all kinds of stuff in school, as you can imagine, with kids. And how come your parents are so white? You know, kind of a thing. And uh, so it's, it was a, a challenge uh, but those challenges are not bad, they're good. Because they are, uh, if you love them, they're blessed. And they may not uh, really appreciate that until later in, as they get older. But nonetheless, um, they got a lot of questions. And, and we went, and she actually located her parents and, or her family in Peru um, and so as she communicated with them, she realized she didn't necessarily want to meet, meet some of them. And, of course, that's with any family, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, so uh, 
we, but she did want to meet a cousin who was in Barcelona. I think it has something to do with the movie, you know, that the, I don't know what they call them, there's old gals, they're singing. Anyway, they're in Barcelona. But anyway, beside the point. So uh, it, it was a good time. We, we got, actually, we said, well, you're not going to go alone. We're going to go with you. She's 32. We're not going <laughs> to, you're not going alone. So we went and spent a week there. And he's a really great guy. And, uh, and just to see them get off, the, she, her, get off the plane and then go up to him and hug. It was like she was home in some sense. She was family. And that was, it was a blessing, and at the same time, a little, you know, difficult. And that's the way it is with adoptive parents. Uh, and so oh, there's a lot of other things, but I don't have time to get into. But it's wonderful as you love them, as you press on as you go th- work through whatever difficulties might be there. It's a blessing. God does a wonderful work. Now, some of you are, well, most of you have not adopted. You've had your children, and the mother's here. And I'm, I'm going to talk about three mothers that are in the Bible. But first... Uh, the title is the mother's the, a mother's heart, a mother's heart. You know that you play a huge role in shaping your children's character and personalities, don't you? Mothers and dads too. And and and, and but that weighs heavily on most mothers more than dads. Isn't that right, mom? Are you shy or hello, hello, hello? I don't know if this is working. Okay. In fact, you're especially good at worrying. I I know that's true. Well, about your children anyway, probably more than dad's. When, 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 they, when, when they're younger, you worry that they cry. And when they're, you worry when they're, well, unhappy, sick. You worry when they're banging around and out of sight. And you worry when they're out of sight, and quiet. You look for the day when they're more independent, and when they are, you worry. But our children also worry. When they're young, they worry when you're not there. And later, when they're in in their teens, they, they worry when you are there, especially when they are peers at home. Later in life, you wonder how they're going to do without you when you're gone. And they wonder that as well. Life is full of twists and turns and for both parent and child. As parents, you, we wonder, couldn't I have done better? And when your children are adults, they wonder, could I have done better? Of course, we all could have, amen? Amen. Children were asked this question to describe their mothers with one word. And here's what what they said. (laughs) One word, worry. That seemed to be the private, you know, majority of what. Anyway, the hug, that's the nurture, dedication, strength, companion, praying, kind, Best friend, that's two words, but protection, loving, caring, strong, pampers, not the kind you wear, 
protecting, friendly, sensitive, funny, and I, I think best of all, weird. That was one kid, weird. That's what my daughter tells me, weird. But like I said, I want to highlight three mothers, two in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And who probably reflected most of those characteristics. These, these parents I'm going to talk about it never wrote a book of the Bible, but they certainly wrote, they wrote into the hearts of their children. And we do the same thing. I say we as parents, but especially mothers. One mother is responsible for a large body of what is written in the Old Testament. I, I know that you've heard of her, but you might not recognize her name. An Egyptian pharaoh demanded that all male infants, infants must be killed. Drowned in, 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 in the Nile. Instead, this mother risked her life by hiding her infant for three months. What infant was that? Moses, yeah. And his mother? Hmm. Her name was Yochaved, which means... Uh, Yahweh is glory. And when she could no longer hide her infant, she placed his fate in the hands of God and put him in a basket that she had made and floated it down the, the Nile River with her daughter hidden in the, and following in the reeds. I'm sure Yochaved prayed that God would somehow deliver him how difficult that must have been to let him go. Can you imagine that? But you know what? Uh, she entrusted him in the Lord. And but no matter how old they are, but it's difficult to let them go. But of course we must. But God's plan would be accomplished in this, in this child. Uh, the, when the ba basket had, was discovered by a princess, a daughter of the pharaoh, who gave the command for the death, and she opened the lid of the basket, that beautiful infant wept. <laughs> and, well, seeing that he was a Hebrew, she still had compassion on the child. And that's when the sister appeared and, and asked her, shall I go and call a nurse for you among the Hebrew women? She said, go. Not knowing that Yochaved was the mother, she gave Moses to her to nurse and to raise, raise him for a time. And so... This was all the work of God. Do you, do you see that here? This was the work of God. And there are many times when you wonder, as you raise your children, Mom, and, and they seem to go astray, whatever, they're in danger, whatever it may be, that, and you wonder, but they are God's work. God is faithful. And I'm sure that Yoko had poured out her life into, you know, into this child <laughs> until she had to return the child to be raised by a pagan princess. Imagine that. Yoko could only watch from a distance as Moses grew and as he became stronger as a young man. Acts chapter 7 says, educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, powerful in speech and action. Wow. So he grew up in a pagan community. With a pagan adoptive mother. Mm -hmm. 
surrounded by idolatry. And I'm guessing surrounded by the faith and prayers of Yochaved, his mother. It's likely that Yochaved heard that Moses had killed an Egyptian taskmaster who was beating a Hebrew slave. And you know the story. He had to flee from Egypt. And, and he, he fled into the wilderness, and his mother never heard about him again. But I'm sure her prayers followed after him. Those prayers were answered. And one day, God called an 80-year-old shepherd on the backside of the wilderness to follow, to follow him. And then... And then God worked his, his miracles through this Moses as one of God's greatest servants to bring the children of Israel out of their slavery. As mothers, you can confidently entrust your children into the hands of God, faithfully keeping them in prayer. That's your task. Not losing hope. Trusting the Lord to do his will in their lives. In some cases, you may never see it. But press on. Again, God is faithful. I wonder what Moses learned from his mother. You know, he wasn't there for a long time. It might have been a few years. But I'm sure, again, she poured her heart out and her life out for this child. Maybe what he learned was something about being courageous. She was courageous. Wise. Maybe he learned how to pray. Maybe even trust God. He somehow identified with the Hebrews... But we just don't know. As much as mothers, you know, can carry the burden and the weight of raising a child, that's, that's a heavy. And we wonder... Could I have done better? But God is faithful. And another mother, as much as mothers love their children, mothers not perfect. Would you agree to that? Husbands don't say anything, but just, <laughs> yeah. I, I, rec I, I, I recommend, again, that husbands just, especially today, say all kinds of positive things about her motherhood. One such mother who was not perfect was about 300 years before Yochaved, before Moses. Her name was Rebecca. Now she had twins with her husband Isaac, who was the grandson of Abraham. I mean the son of Abraham. He was son, Abraham, Isaac, oh yeah, and then Jacob. God had revealed to, to her, to Rebecca, that she was, you know, it was a difficult pregnancy and kind of a battle going on inside of her with these twins. Now the older was Esau and the younger was Jacob. Remember, he was holding on to the heel of Esau. But the Lord had revealed to her that the older would serve the younger. Now, as the boys grew, 
Isaac favored Esau. Well, he was the firstborn. He was rough. He was hairy. (laughs) And he was a mighty hunter. He was all boy. He liked that. On the other hand, Rebecca favored Jacob. Now, the Bible tells us that he's described there as a mild man, a man of tents. <clears throat> he must have been a good cook, too. Remember when Esau came back from a hunt, he asked Jacob to cook him some stew. And Jacob replied, first of all, sell me your birthright. And he did. What is a birthright? Well, it was an inheritance, an inheritance that would be divided among the sons. In this case, two sons. An additional equal portion was set aside. Two sons, there we go, plus one additional portion. So there's different three different portions, and that portion upon the death of the father would actually go to the firstborn. Okay. Well, that's the way it ought to have gone, but, but Esau considered that as worthless for the bowl of stew. He despised his birthright, is what the Bible tells us. So Esau traded this portion of the inheritance for a bowl of stew. Later, their father Isaac thought he was coming to the end of his life, and so he planned to bless Esau. This is where the mom gets involved. In spite of God's word to Rebekah that the older would serve the younger, and even though Esau had despised his birthright, the blessing was a way of, to designate who became the head of the, this extended family when the father died. Like the birthright, the blessing usually went to the firstborn. Isaac probably thought he saw the, the mighty hunter, all boy, was a better choice to carry on the family name than... than <laughs> Then Jacob, his younger one, who liked to dwell in tents and planned to bless Esau over Jacob, contradicting God's plan. Rebecca got wind of it and jumped into action. While Esau was hunting to, game, you know, to get game to bring home to and cook up for his father, again, a stew, Rebecca convinced Jacob to imitate Esau. Now, that was not an easy task. Can you imagine this? Esau was a hairy dude, and he smelled like the bush. Rebecca cooked some delicious stew she knew her husband loved and then dressed him in Esau's smelly clothes and then took a, a, a baby goat's or, you know, hide, and, and she put it on the back of the hands of Jacob and then also on the smooth part of his neck. And he said, well, how would that fool anybody? I bet you thought that. I used to think that. Probably still do. But anyway, but Esau, uh, Isaac rather, Isaac was, was pretty much blind. And, and all, I would imagine in his advanced, advanced, he was over 100 years old. He was in his advanced age. He was losing some sense of smell and maybe even touch. And so he blessed. The ruse worked. He blessed Jacob. Now, and this is what he said, many nations serve you. And peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who cursed you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Wow. Any hope that Esau had in becoming 
the top dog in the family was shattered. Mother and son, they got what they wanted through deception, right? Like mother, like favorite son, or something like that anyway, you know. In the end, by God's grace, God would have his way even with imperfect mothers and sons. And by the way, dads too. Amen? God had his way. I, I remember something Spurgeon said after all. Uh, uh, you know, the Bible says that God, Jacob, I have loved referring to God, but Esau I have hated. A woman once said to the great preacher again, Spurgeon, I, I cannot understand why God should say that he hated Esau. That, Spurgeon replied, is not my problem, madam. My trouble is to understand how God could love Jacob. He was the deceiver. God had graciously revealed to Rebecca something of his plan for Jacob, and she decided to help God out. Now, is that a good idea? Hmm. She could serve him, but they took matters into their own hands rather than trust God. And that was the problem. That too became part of Jacob's Personality. Remember how you as mothers have such an influence and impact on your children that they begin to follow your example. But imperfect mothers need to trust God. They need to repent when necessary and pray always. I wonder what word Jacob might use to describe his mother when we think about those children and the things that they said. And you know, do you think, what do you think that word might have been? I'll wait. I don't want to preach by myself. I'm I'm counting on you. What do you think word that he might have used to describe his mother, Rebecca. Loving. Very good. How about that? Loving? That's what he was to her. Uh, She was to him. She, She was motivated by love, wasn't she? Any, any other ideas? Well, okay. I'll stop waiting. Thank you. <laughs> Loving. How about concerned? But again, I think he recognized what she did was deceptive. Jacob reflected all of those things in his life. He could love, he could show concern, but he was also deceptive. Got him in a lot of trouble. There's another woman, a mother, in the New Testament. Now this one, it's a famous mother, Mary, mother of Jesus. Now, I grew up as a Roman Catholic, studied for the priesthood, left as an unbeliever. Two years later, came to Christ. But one thing I did is I I belonged to a Spanish order that was very uh, dedicated to Mary, called Claritians. For eight years, left home when I was 16. 
I'm sure that was difficult for my mom. But when I left, I, you know, of course, lost all of the respect I had for Mary. And as Protestants, a lot of times, we also ridicule the Catholic Church because of what they believe about Mary. And of course, they believe a lot of wrong doctrine that's there. But we want to somehow bring Mary down and almost denigrate her. But it's important to recognize that this was one heck of a mother. She was an amazing woman. If you think about it, in Luke in chapter 1, for instance, in verse 31 and 35, Mary is visited by an angel, right? And this angel says all of these things that's going to happen with Jesus and, and so on. And, and she says, and, she, and behold, you will conceive and you're in your womb and bring forth a son, is what he told her, and shall call his name Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. She might have been 15 years old. This was not, would not be a, have been un, unusual at that time. Can you imagine? Her response was this. In Luke 20, uh, verse 1, verse 38. Let it, be, let it be to me according to your word. According to your word. <clears throat> For a teenage girl betrothed to a young man, this was not an easy thing to say. It could cost her her life. The angel also spoke to Joseph, her betrothed. Do not be afraid to take to yourself Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit working in the hearts of a young woman and a young man, such faith, such faithful servants of God. Can you imagine? Both loved this child when he was born. And yet, it would not be easy. Mary, the mother, and Joseph, the adoptive father. This would not be easy. In Mary's case, <laughs> giving birth to a baby, before that, 80 miles from Nazareth, to Bethlehem, on the back of a donkey, very pregnant. Then giving birth, perhaps that night, when they arrived in Bethlehem, in a barn, lying him in an in, in animal's trough, feeding trough, for a bed. And then shepherds coming and telling a uh, you know, telling of an angel who came to them and there is born to you this day, the night, the, this night of uh, uh, the, the, David, your Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. For most, this would have been a hard thing to believe. But Mary again, Mary in verse Chapter 2, verse 19. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I think that mother, mothers are, are very good at, uh, and probably better, have better memories than, than dads. Um, and you know why? I, I think they ponder these things in their hearts. Men don't ponder. We move on, right? How many times do you tell your wife, we got to move on? Well, you, you know, you don't seem to be concerned about this. Oh, well, 
Then I move on. In Luke 2, 34 through 35, days later in the infant's dedication and circumcision in Jerusalem, a man named Simeon, filled with the Holy Spirit, when he saw the infant, rejoiced. My eyes have seen your salvation, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Then he said to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What could that mean? A salvation, which was the good news, but a sword seemed like the bad news. Now, years later, in Jerusalem, again, in the celebration of the Passover, the parents of a lost 12-year-old child, frantically searching for, for him throughout the crowded streets of Jerusalem, finally, after three days, find him in the temple in Jerusalem there, And asked him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Do you recall what his answer was? Did you not know that I must be about what? My father's business. Well, that must have been a sharp sword. Both to Mary and to Joseph. But what did Mary do in Luke 2.51? But his mother kept, stored up all these things in her heart. She pondered them. Now she kept, stored up all of these things in her heart. Not stored up to, for bitterness sake, but wondering what it all meant. And perhaps feeling like the child, her child was pulling away. That's a hard thing for moms. Years later, the wedding feast in Cana. They ran out of wine. It is an embarrassment to the groom. And Mary said to Jesus, they have no wine. In a way that only a mother could say. And Jesus answered, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Mary apparently thought it had. He was kind of, well, gently reminding her that it wasn't her place to direct his ministry. Another sword. Another, in a sense, pulling away. And as our children pull away, Mom, this is hard to watch them. On the other hand, you want and them to be independent, but then the concern. And finally at the cross, Jesus, seeing his mother and his disciples standing by, said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And to his disciple, behold, your mother. The separation was now complete. Again, the sword. But you know the story, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And Mary must have realized at that moment, no longer son. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Jesus is Lord. 
And you say, well, she must have known that. I don't know. She was pondering these things. She was considering these things. And Jesus was pulling away and pulling away and pulling away. And I would imagine as any mother wanting to hold him close and being concerned about the choices of the making, whatever, Jesus in the ministry, he was pouring out his life for the crowds. In fact, remember the mother and, and, and his brothers who came to take him away. And here he was in the house, and, and, and word came to him. He said, your mother and your brothers are outside. They, they, they want to come in and see you. And he says, oh. And he looked around at uh, uh, the, the, the people sitting around him, and he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. That must have been like another sore. And so many of the, those instances and her concern and her worry, and yet now he, on that cross, but then the resurrection. The realization of what he has done changed the whole world. But the question is, what influence did Mary have on her son? Now, this is a hard one. Je- Jesus was fully, what do we say, fully man and Fully God. What I find is most people can grasp the idea of fully God, but they have a hard time grasping the concept of fully man. Jesus was fully man, and he was her son. Perhaps her love, her humility, her willingness, and her servant's heart impacted Jesus. Now, wait a minute, he was the son of God. No one's going to impact him. I think his mother did. I don't, you know, when he was yay high, growing, do you think her love might have impacted him? Seeing that love, her willingness, her servant's heart, Mary's word, let it be done to me according to your word, to the angel, sounds really familiar to the words of Jesus uh, spoken at Gethsemane in the garden there when the, the night of his arrest, when he said to God, not my will, but yours be done. I'm not sure on what level or how that worked or any of those things, but Mary had an impact on Jesus. And mothers, you have a tremendous impact on your children. Pray, courage, love, the very things that the kids were saying about the things that they saw in their mothers. And they said those things because they were impacted by that. And they identified their mothers with those terms. I wonder how Jesus would have described his mother. Perhaps many of the same words as the children describing their mothers. Nurture, dedication, strength, companion, Praying, kind, protection, caring, willing, and above all, loving. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Loving. Perhaps that's why God had chosen Mary as the mother of his son. He had been working in her. She was one who was ready to receive. And he is working in you, Mom. Are you ready to receive? Do you see yourself in all of these things? In all of these women? A woman who raises a child, but to save him, lets him go.
the mother that we met her in Peru. That's what she was doing. She took that child, gave him to us to save her. I'm forever grateful for her. There was one, again, the the deceptive one, imperfect one, who passed on some of those qualities to her son Jacob, and yet God used all of those things for his glory, to show his grace and his mercy, his power. Perhaps you've had kind of a background, drugs, a background that you don't like to admit to. Pray. Trust the Lord. Come to Christ. Give your heart to him. You still have an impact on your children. And then, of course, Mary. Sure, she wasn't perfect either, but she loved And perhaps that's why God chose you as a mother of your children. Amen. Amen. Proverbs again. I'm going to read it a little differently now. May your children stand and bless you, mom. May your husband praise you. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. A woman who fears the Lord commits her life to raising your child. Will be praised.